Hi there, and welcome to this video, where I'm trying to find an answer to the question, where is the good life in Arcane? To try and answer this, I will primarily look into the setting of the show. When you watch Arcane, you get two radically different environments, two types of lifestyles, Piltover and the Undercity. But though it would seem so, they are not two separate neighbouring cities. Yes, the Undercity is a part of Piltover, I think. Or is it a suburb? A neighbourhood? An attachment of sorts, maybe? In any case, the Undercity is under Piltover's jurisdiction, that's for sure. But the people living there are not real citizens, more like sub-dwellers with no rights, but plenty of obligations. And this is what Silco wants to end by making the Undercity independent under the nation of Zorn. So we know how Silco feels about the two parts of the city. But how are the viewers supposed to feel? Which of these two settings and lifestyles is the best one, or the right one? Who do we favour? Who should we favour? Are we supposed to want to unite the two parts into one, or pick a side? I think that as a viewer, you are hard pressed to pick a favourite, since both lifestyles and environments are flawed. So let's start out by delving into how the two settings are portrayed and what the upsides and downsides are to each of them. Maybe then we can come to a decision. If we start with the positive aspects of Piltover, what comes to mind first is that it is the city of progress. It is a prosperous and technologically advanced society that has an established ruling body as well as a university. They trade in their technology and with the invention of Hextech, Piltover turns into a hub in Rune Terrace infrastructure, shipping therefore becoming a major source of income. The city is independent in the sense that the city is the state, a nation in the classical Greek sense. It is a polis right down to the oligarchic system of government where only the extremely rich and powerful have a seat. The city's appearance is very positive too, very bright light and colours. It consists of wide streets and avenues, the tall buildings and manor houses beset with architectural details and towers reaching for the stars. The sky is often blue here and the air is clean. People feel safe on the streets, which are regularly policed. The negative aspects of Piltover lie mostly in its population, its rulers in particular. The councillors seem to be filthy rich snobs that have no concept of how the other half lives. They are completely caught up in their own affairs, businesses and schemes. Corruption, manipulation and self-interest seem to be behind most of the oligarchic council's decisions. Everybody seems to be performing in a political dance, wearing masks, and trying not to step out of place. The city's police are not peacekeepers, but enforcers. So the violence is already inherent in their name, and we see many examples of them using and abusing the power they have, especially on the Undercity. There are strict rules and norms in Piltover, especially of the social kind, and the council has a say in almost everything that happens. Overall, it is a duplicitous place, with ambiguous morals and egotistical rulers. The positive aspects of the Undercity lie mostly in its general population and the relative freedom they have. They aren't bound by rules and norms as to how to dress, how to behave. They don't have to perform or put on a mask, but be who they are and express themselves freely. The sense of community is also great, and they seem to take care of each other. The show's two protagonists come from the Undercity, so naturally our focus is on their situation and the good we initially see between them. There's a natural sense of family, love and interconnection in the Undercity. The negative aspects of the Undercity come first and foremost from its setting. It is dark, dank, cramped and toxic. They hardly see the light of day and it is literally a hazard to breathe in the air. People live on top of each other in tight spaces with little comfort and nourishment. Most of the population are oppressed by poverty, but they're also under the thumb of not only Piltover and its enforcers, but also of various crime lords, Silco in particular, 
who enforces his rule primarily by addiction to shimmer. So to sum up, and to generalize a little bit, Piltover setting good, Undercity setting bad, Piltover people bad, Undercity people good. Solution? Well, lose the topsiders and move the people of the Undercity there instead. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> ridiculous solution, I know. But I had fun with it. Anyway, both settings have positive aspects, but they both fail too. An example is seen in episode 6, where we see Victor's backstory from when he was a child in the Undercity. The river water that runs through here is extremely polluted, shown by the rainbow of colours on the surface that come from oil spills. The green colouring shows an overgrowth of algae, which means little can survive in the water. The fact that Victor is sickly supports this. But apart from Victor's struggles, it is a happy setting. The other Undercity children play in its waters, laughing, swimming, jumping. Everything is lively and energetic. The place is green and overgrown, life incarnate. Later on, when we see Victor returning as an adult, the water is squeaky clean, probably due to the machines seen behind Victor, most likely of his engineering. What a triumph for a Zornite to use Piltover resources and education to help the Undercity, giving them a cleaner life. But is it a triumph, really? Because the children, the laughter and the greens are gone. There's practically no life left. That has been scrubbed away, too. So is it progress? Does progress, in fact, lead to emptiness, loneliness and estrangement? Also, when it comes to characters, it is hard to pick a side. Piltover has many morally dubious characters, but it has also fostered Caitlin and Jace, inherently good characters, even though Jace seems to be led astray by politics towards the end of season one, and Caitlin is who she is, despite where she comes from. We also see Victor, who has been given a chance of a good life and an education in Piltover. He would probably be long dead if he hadn't. On the other hand, out of the Undercity comes Vi, Vanda, Echo and again Victor, all very positive characters. On both sides, the characters are influenced in good or bad directions equally. The settings are opposites, and yet so much more. There's always something that can disprove any generalization like the one I did earlier. Such depth in the writing, I love it. To give an example of the show's resistance to pigeonholing, Let's look at the very first time we see Piltover. It is seen through the eyes of Vi, who is on the bridge in between the two parts of town. Dark smoke and red colours of hate and blood dominate the scene, and the stern images on the bridge look down at Vi, who has just lost her parents. All her anger and hate is directed at the Enforcers and at Piltover, as we pan up from her position below. But despite this negative mood, the clouds part over topside, the sky is blue, and the music changes to a much lighter tone. Definitely doesn't appear to be the scum of the earth as Vi was just thinking. In my opinion, I would say that the Undercity has sort of the same feel and look as the setting in the film Moulin Rouge. Here we follow a group of penniless artists living in the underbelly of Paris. They're from the lowest part of society, catering to the needs of the upper class, but this gives them the opportunity to live freely without the stranglehold of society's rules and norms. Art for art's sake and all that. It's a romantic idea which doesn't hold water in reality. Because they are not really free, the upper class only lets them be free as long as it benefits them. Plus, the characters die of illnesses associated with poverty anyway. Same goes for the Undercity. I also get connotations to the Wild West. Again, a romanticized idea of a free life for those who are brave enough and skilled enough to create it from scratch. It's also a place full of pleasure houses catering to the wealthy and the powerful. But it is a place where might is right. Those who have power are the ones who are strong or smart enough to take it. So, 
if I'm hard pressed, I would probably say that despite everything, and because we see it in a somewhat romantic light, that the most good comes from the setting of the Undercity. Viewers generally favour the underdogs. Maybe. What do you think? But, do we have to pick a side? I don't think that we're supposed to pick one over the other entirely. The right thing is probably either to mix the two, or find a third option. And as it so happens, we do have a third option. A place that is a mixture of Piltover and the Undercity, as well as a promise of a good life. The Firelight Community. This setting has all its positive traits from both sides. The good, honest people of the Undercity, living free, defending themselves, fighting for the right to live, to breathe, to evolve, to escape addiction, and to love each other. And this is put together with a pilty setting of a wide open space, bright lights and colours, and fresh air. The firelights embrace both the past and the future. They have room to grow. And when Mr Piltover himself, Heimerdinger, joins their little commune, adding his experience both as a scientist and as a leader of an established society, Echo and his firelights appear to be the hope of Arcane, symbolised nicely by the ubiquitous green colouring. Another thing that supports this idea is the fact that the only people who visit the firelights apart from Heimerdinger in the end are Vi and Caitlin. And why is this relevant? Well, for one, they're the only two characters who truly traverse both parts of the city, and they do it together. For another, they start out as extreme representatives of each setting, by growing up as an orphaned undercity street brawler, and Caitlin as a well-bred, well-educated, rich and sheltered topsider. But they end up meeting in the middle, finding common ground and common values, proof that the two sides can meet and cooperate. Vi and Caitlin bridge the gap, literally. They are seen genuinely hugging each other on the bridge between the two cityscapes. They're the hope for the future, along with Echo and the Firelights, who are also represented on the bridge. Echo is there, and he meets Heimerdinger under the bridge the morning after. Heimerdinger picks up the injured Echo and helps him home, just as Vi picks up an injured Caitlin and takes her home. <laughs> Good God, almost everything in this show is paralleled. At least, that's what I interpret. So I have decided to put all my eggs in their baskets. And after coming to that conclusion, I think I will sign off. So, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Now I'd like to hear your thoughts. Bye!